Do you guys want to know how to optimize the bass in your home theater system with PEQ filters? That's what we're going to be talking about in today's video. Hey folks, I'm Gene Delisalo with Audioholics. You know, I've been getting asked to make a video through our Patreon channel as well as on YouTube from you guys about how to use PEQ filters, parametric equalization, to flatten the bass response in your room. So I wanted to do a very basic introductory video. I'm only going to show you how to calculate one filter and how to correct that one, that one response, that one bump you might have in your bass response because I want you guys to really kind of get used to this idea and then we could do more advanced videos. But before we get into showing you the measurements and how to do this, I wanna first show you what a PEQ filter is. So this is just a graphical representation of a PEQ filter. Your center frequency is the bump that you'll find in your bass response. And then the bandwidth of it is F1 to F2. So when you want to calculate the Q, you're going to see when, you, when you're using PEQ filters, you're going to have a center frequency and a Q. The Q is just the center frequency divided by F2 minus F1. That's your Q. That's the width of the correction that you're going to do. So if you are correcting for a very wide area, you're going to have a low Q. If you're correcting for a very narrow area, you're going to have a high Q. And generally speaking, when it comes to doing um, manual EQ filters like this. I don't like doing very high Q correction. I don't think it's, I don't think it's necessary in most cases and it could cause more harm than good. I usually don't correct anything more than like a Q of like seven or eight, especially at base frequencies, but that's a topic for another video that we could talk about. So the first thing I want to show you is this is my seating arrangement in my theater room right now. You go, you've got the beautiful Valencia seat in here, the Tuscanies. My front row's got four of those seats. The back row's got three of those seats. So it's a very wide, uh, at a very wide area that I'm calibrating for. I've I've seen so many times online where people are like getting this really flat bass response in their room and they're only measuring at the MLP. That's the main listening position. I think that's a huge mistake. I think you, if you're going to have good bass response in a room, every seat should have good bass response. That's why we preach multiple subs. That's why um, getting the optimization for not just one seat, but for all of your seats. And if you ever hire a calibrator and all they want to do is calibrate the main seat, they're not a very good calibrator. Most of the professional calibrators out there, like the Anthony Gramanis, Matthew Pose, and myself, we use a multi-mic measurement uh, technique where we measure all the seats and we try to find the best fit for all the seats because you can potentially dial in a very small area and then it messes up the other seats. And that's the biggest thing about when you're doing PEQ filters is when you get a system that has multiple subs and you get the seat to seat consistency closer together, when you have a problematic frequency, you could cut that problem and it will solve it for not just that one seat, but for most of your seats, if not all of your seats. And that's really the end game of what we're trying to do here. So let me share my screen. And I opened up a REW file to do the measurements on. And you're going to see, I'm going to focus just on the front row right now. And I'm going to show you um, before and after equalization. So we're going to start with the first seat with the money seat or the MLP, the, the main listening position. I call it a money seat. I'm old school. What do you want me to tell you? Um, this is the base response without the correction for the bump that we're seeing that's now centered at around 21 hertz. So if we go and we look at the other seats, let's look at seat number one, seat number three, and seat number four. As you can see, all of these seats have a common 21 Hertz bump and it's pretty substantial. You know, it's really, if you look at it, it's, it's about seven dB too hot, seven or eight dB too hot. And it's common here. So the great thing about that is one PEQ filter centered at 21 Hertz will flatten that response out. So if I go into my calculator and I do 21, 
is my center frequency. And I say the three dB points around, uh, I was, I think it was around 18 Hertz that I calculated. I was trying to get rid of a lot of excessive bass. And then I went up to about 23 Hertz. So 23 minus 18. So you got, that's five. So 21 divided by five, that's a Q of 4.25. Now I go into my storm processor. I'm going to log into that real quick. I got to turn it on. Now, everybody has different ways of, of, of software to do what I'm doing here. Let me just talk about that for a minute before. Whoop, I was watching Karate Kid. <laughs> um, let me talk about that for a minute. So Yamaha has manual PEQs, which is what I really like about their receivers. They have uh, seven band PEQ per channel. You can go in and you could adjust the center frequency, the Q and the amplitude of it. Very easy to use. You could do it uh, through the web editor app or you can do it even through their receiver uh, uh, through the GUI. Um, Sound United, the Den and the Moran stuff, typically didn't have that capability with Odyssey because Odyssey was mostly automatic and it tried to do it for you. Then they had the Odyssey editor app where you can go in with your iPad and kind of shape that response. It was a bit, you know, kludgy worked, but it was a bit kludgy, but you had to run the calibration in order to get access to that. Well, now they have Odyssey X and now it's PC interfaced. So you can go in there and you can actually set their FIR based filters, but they look graphically like PEQ. So it, the principle works very similar. I think it's great that they're doing that. Um, when Odyssey first came out, um, I was one of the first to test Odyssey on the Denon 5805. And then I had Chris Kiriakakis come to my other house, my theater room, who was with Odyssey. And he brought the, Edis the Odyssey Pro box, which had its own microphone. And we worked out a system of calibration with that. It was really great. And that thing actually had the ability to go in and to do as many filters as you wanted, much more powerful than what you were getting in the receiver. And I played with that for years, just dialing in the base of my system. That was awesome. So it's great that we're getting that capability back now into the AVRs with Odyssey because there's a lot of potential there. I'll be doing future videos on that. I just wanted to give you a basic here on how to calculate your PEQ filters so you could flatten the response of your system. So let's go back to the measurements that I was doing here. So you can see the problem again is at 21 Hertz. We know I need to put a filter in and to cut that out. So let me actually go. Oh, we got Mr. Crease again. Go back to my system here. Now in my system, it's a little bit more complex than probably 98% of the people watching this video. I've got my main towers actually have subwoofer LFE going through them as well. So in your case, you're probably running base managed speakers and all the base is coming from one or two subs or more. And you're going to be doing this PEQ filter to the subwoofer channel in most cases. So I'm going to just pretend that going into the left front channel here, it's just pretend it's my subwoofer channel. And this is a really slick interface that Storm Audio has. It shows you the graphical stuff of what you've done here. But here's the filter that I wanted to focus with you guys on. I showed you the problem frequency was at 21 hertz. Got a bell-shaped filter here. You're not going to have that probably selectability in most receivers. It's going to just default to something like this. But anyways, you might not even see that. It'll just tell you the frequency, the gain, and the Q. So in my case, I, I calculated the Q was like 4.2, 4.25. I did a cut of 8 dB. I did that to basically both of my main speakers because they have subwoofers in them and to my subwoofer channel as well. I've got additional subs in the rear of, of the room. So now I want to show you the results. So let's go back to seat two, which is the MLP, no EQ and now C2 EQ. Now I had some other filters engaged too, so you could see it flatten that out. But look at the difference now. So we went from you know 95 dB peak here, we got that down to about 89 dB. So that was a significant increase in, in flatness here. 
that big bump there is no longer there. It just looks much more linear. You know, and I think part of the problem when people think ported subs are slow and sealed subs are fast is because generally speaking, ported subs have more output at the lower registers, you know, above the tuning frequency or right below the tuning frequency, you get some port gain there. And if you don't control the modal response in the room and you're exciting those room modes and you don't flatten it out with whether positional EQ, multi-sub or parametric EQ like this, you're going to think that that subwoofer sounds slow because you just have excess of bass energy in those frequencies. And it's just a myth when people say ported subs are slow because they're not. You can look at a group delay measurement on any good subwoofer whether it's sealed or ported, and if it's under a cycle and a half at the low frequencies, then it's going to be a good transient response subwoofer. So don't be afraid of ported subs. But anyways, you can see a big flatness increase here with the parametric filter that I put in. Let's look at the other seats. So let's look at seat number one, no EQ. Seat number one with EQ, same result. Because we found a common problem in all the seats, we could apply the one filter to that problem and it'll fix all of those seats. Again, I have to reiterate, I'm measuring at multiple seats, not just one mic position like you often see people doing calibrations with. So let's look at seat number three, without EQ versus with EQ. Again, it's much more linear. We got rid of that big peak. And that peak, you could hear it when I turn those filters on and off. With the filters off, initially it says, oh, you got more bass, it's you know, it's deep, but it's bloated. It doesn't sound as articulate. When you do critical listening and you have a more linear bass response here, it just makes a world of difference of how much better it can sound. So let's look at seat number four, last but not least. With EQ is green, without EQ is red. And there's a big flatness um, performance increase here. So it worked. So that's what I wanted to show you. Now I'm going to show you all four seats EQ'd. So we got EQ here, EQ here, EQ. And you can see the seat to seat consistency is pretty darn good here. I always aim, I want all my seats to be plus or minus 5 dB from, in this case, 15 hertz out to, you know, a few hundred hertz. I'm pretty close. I could do some more optimization here. I, I, um, I'm not finished, but in the worst case here, that's at about 77 dB to 86 dB. So it's a plus or minus 5 dB. Even though that looks bad, it's because I'm zoomed in. That's the other thing you got to be careful about. You can see people online, and they, when they post their graphs, they will put large scales. So they'll maybe change that to 35 to 125. Oh, maybe that's a little bit excessive. Oh, it, it messed up here. Let's say 110. So it looks much better because I zoomed out. So keep that in mind. I typically use 60 dB scales when I show my measurements. That's pretty standard. Five to five. Kind of where I'm at. And that's a pretty good response. I'm going to be working on this. Um, I've got some acoustic treatments I'm going to be changing out in the room in the coming months. And I'm going to be repositioning one of my subs because um, I have a better location for it. I just don't have the pre-wire there yet. But you're going to see this tighten up. I've done articles in the past um, at my old place using mini DSP. And I'll link it in this video below where I've got the C to C consistency at plus or minus five dB across two rows, six seats from 13 Hertz out to 200 Hertz. And let me tell you when any seat I sat in, in my, in my old theater, it, the base was constant. Like it just, you couldn't tell there was a difference in perceived base. The back row had a little bit of an elevated response because it was closer to a back wall. That's a challenge. When you have seats on a back wall, you're, you're sitting near a maximum pressure area. You're going to get more boundary gain, more standing wave uh, buildup. You got to get those seats away from that area. We generally don't like to put seats more than a quarter of the length of the room from the back wall. So try to keep them, you know, if you have a 20 foot long room, try to keep that back row at least five feet off the back wall. 
Otherwise, you're just going to get too much base in that area. And you can EQ some of that out, but it's going to make the front row suffer. So I, you know, I hope this video helped you guys. We can definitely go further into this topic in future videos. We could talk about setting a room curve. Um, that's a whole other topic for another video. And we can get more advanced calibration stuff. I kind of want to gauge what you guys think and see, you know, how many views we get on this video to see if people are really interested in this topic. Don't forget about our Patreon channel at patreon.com slash audioholics. We appreciate your support. You get direct access to me if you want to ask questions or suggest video topics. And until next time, my friends, keep listening.